topics where they focus their research programs. Today, we welcome Dr. Pei Liu as our speaker. Dr. Liu is a hospitality management assistant professor. She joined the hospitality management program in 2016 and has taught courses in food science, dietetics, and hospitality management. Her applied research projects have touched on topics such as consumption behaviors and food safety practices in ethnic restaurants and farms. Today, Dr. Liu will present about a project that has a long-term goal to develop a customized and culturally sensitive Food Safety Modernization Act education and outreach training program for Hmong farmers in Southwest Missouri. As she presents today, please add any questions that come to mind in the Q&A tab, and we'll hold all questions until the end of the presentation. So with that, it's time to begin this afternoon's presentation. You can take it away, Pei. Okay, so can you see my shared screen, PowerPoint? Yes. Perfect. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining my presentation this afternoon. Um, the projects I'm doing is the development and implementation of a customized and culturally sensitive FASMA supplemental training program for Hmong farmers. So this project is funded by USDA NIFA Food Safety Outreach Program in 2020. And uh, this is a still ongoing project. And I'm happy to share some of the preliminary um, results that we have done. And before I'm moving forward to um, talk about the project, I just want to talk about um, to um, our te great team members uh, that include to um, uh, for these projects. So without their assistance and effort, um, I'm, not, I'm not able to make these projects possible. So this is a collaboration between the hospitality program at Mizu, uh, as well as the Mizu Extension and the Lincoln University. So give you a little bit of background about this project. Um, according to the census data, there were about uh, more than 180,000 Hmong population in the US. That was in the year 2000. And the number has increased to more than 300,000 in 2017. And I believe this number and also increased um, by today. And unfortunately, unfortunately, I do not have the recent census data. And just looking at the data in Missouri, um, because most of the Hmong um, residents live in the Southwest Missouri. So in 2010, there were about more than 1300 Hmong residents in the Southwest location uh, in the Missouri state. And then um, just look at their farming opportunities. Most Hmong farmers are managing pretty small scale farming operations and also with hand tool and man, uh, manual labor. Um, and um, according to a study uh, conducted in the Southwest uh, Food Safety Conferences in 2017 um, to identify their food safety risk, and more than 97% of the Hmong farmers do not have a food safety plan. So that actually identified some food safety risks. So because of that, uh, the Hmong farmers um, actually continue to handle their food safe, uh, their prepared food, and also um, handling food using their traditional ways that present a unique food safety challenges. So just give you a little bit of background about uh, the food safety training that we used in, the, in our project. So the Food Safety and Modernization Act uh, was signed into law in 2011 um, because the goal of this FASMA training is to prevent the contamination in the U.S. food supply chain instead of responding to the contamination issues. So this act actually is to preventing food safety, uh, food safety issues. And then one of the goal is to provide food safety trainings to farmers. So food produce safety is one of the key focus areas of FASMA. Um, this law is required um, to farmers uh, as long as you are um, as long as you are a new 
um, the average annual monetary value of produce of the farm sold during the previous three years is between 25,000 to 250,000. And if, if your annual sales is between that range and your, one of the managers on farm is required to be FASMA certified, and then you have to take the, the FASMA training. So based on the previous study, some challenges um, has present um, to carry out when the training is provided to Hmong farmers. So for example, the convenience location for food safety training is one of them. So some participants indicated when the training is provided, it's always far away from the farm where the farm is located. And so that created barrier when the participants to participate in the training at a central location. And also the training format is another barrier because they because the participants, the Hmong farmers are not used to be trained using the classroom setting. And the language is also a challenge because most of the Hmong farmers do not speak or do not read English. Cultural differences, like a cultural background, present another challenge. So because of those challenges, our current projects, um, the current food safety training program that developed by USDA and FDA do not address the need for this specific population. To overcome the challenges, the goal, the long-term goal of our project is to develop a customized and also cultural, sen culturally sensitive FASMA, supplement, uh, su FASMA supplemental training or educational outreach training program for Hmong farmers in the Southwest Missouri. So to our achieve this long-term goal, and we have three specific objectives. So first, we can identify the specific food safety training and educational needs and the food safety challenges faced by local Hmong farmers with a particular consideration of their cultural values. And then we're gonna develop the innovative, culturally sensitive and easy to understand the food safety training supplemental materials guided by FASMA for Hmong farmers in English and Hmong. And then lastly, we will evaluate the training program developed from the second objective and by the farmers and to assess the usability and also the potential effectiveness. So now I'm gonna move on to the approach to achieve those three objectives one by one. So to achieve the first objective, there are three steps. So the first step, so we will evaluate the food safety training, the food safety knowledge, and also interview with Hmong farmers to understand what are the barriers, um, what are, to understand their current feelings uh, of the food safety training program, and also understand the, the barriers when they participate their current food safety training program. And the second step is to interview the Produce Safety Alliance certified trainers. So this, food, uh, this Produce Safety Alliance, this PSA, actually is a partnership that created between Cornell, Uni Cornell University, USDA, and FDA in 2010. So PSA's role actually includes um, offering the growers training course to assist the domestic and foreign produce industry, as well as provide small and very small farms um, regulatory personnel by providing a good foundation to their farming practices. So providing FASMA training is one of the roles for PSA trainers. So we're going to interview the trainers to understand their barriers when providing training to Hmong farmers. So we want to understand the uh, story from uh, both sides, the trainers and also trainees. And the lastly, we are going to do the observation to observe what, like, what are the real food safety practices when Hmong farmers uh, operate on their farms. So to assess their food safety knowledge, 
we adopt the food safety knowledge uh, instrument that developed by the North Central Region Center for FESMA training. So I'm gonna click on this link. So here are 25 food safety questions that are developed by this training, the North Center. Um, so those questions are all related with FASMA um, materials um, that they used in the center that before and post, um, before and post to test the training, uh, FASMA training uh, effectiveness. Um, so those are the multiple choices questions. And so we use the same questions to test our Hmong farmers food safety knowledge. And of course, when we test their knowledge, those questions were translated in Hmong and we had a translator there. And then we did this one by one with our Hmong farmers. Okay. Um, so when we did an interview with the Hmong farmers, we uh, asked the help or assistance um, from the Lincoln University ambassador um, who did the translation from English to Hmong and also from Hmong to English to facilitate the communication between the MU researchers and also the farmers. So the interviews with the trainers um, and also with the Hmong farmers were all audio recorded, transcribed verbatim and also used for the preliminary indexing for, of the concepts and themes. And then all those interviews were coded using Microsoft Excel for summary. So for the second objective, which is ongoing, uh, is about developing the supplemental food safety training materials based on the results that from the objective one. And the last objective is we will to uh, we will access the effectiveness of the food safety supplemental program that's gonna meet specific needs for these local Hmong farmers, Hmong farmers. So there are two steps involved to, to evaluate the effectiveness. First, we're gonna implement this program with Hmong farmers, and then we're gonna test their knowledge, food safety knowledge um, before and after this uh, implementation of the program. And then we're gonna do a farm observation two weeks after the training is over. And the second step is we're gonna also ask the PSA trainers to evaluate this program. So now let's move on to look at our pre, some preliminary results. Um, for the participants, there are a total of five uh, Hmong farmers were recruited in the projects. So three uh, male farmers and two female farmers. So in terms of the age, one in 30s, one in 40s, two 60s, and one 70s. Uh, education level, uh, what two has, uh, two have associated degree. One has less than high school degree and one has a 60 degree, a sixth grade and the one had a vocational tech, technical college degree. So here, what are the results for the assessment of their food safety knowledge among those farmers? Okay. So um, just a little bit um, clarification. So before we are met, measuring their food safety knowledge, we realized not all farmers have the same food safety knowledge. So they were not on the same page because some of the farmers had FASMA training before, but some did not. So then um, we decided to make sure this study is valid. We have, to, we have to include, we have to add another FASMA training and to make sure everybody were on the same page before starting this project. So three out of five did not have any FASMA training before. Then we invited one uh, FASMA trainer from Minnesota who can speak, who speak Hmong and to provide a half day of FASMA training in Hmong. And then we actually host one day FASMA training. The only difference is they cannot be certified 
because if they can if they if they if if you need to get if you can get a certified FASMA certified, then you have to be pre-registered from USDA, and it's going to be a three days long training because of the time this restraint, and we will not be able to do that. So we kind of condensed the time and then to put all the um, contents. We use the same contents, but we just put everything in short, and um, so we were able to do this in one day training. And so we did a half day in English that like provided by like the picture to your lab, the first picture by English trainer. And then another half day, like you presented, uh, you can see in, this, in the middle picture that was taught by a Hmong trainer that we invited from Minnesota and, uh, and he taught on Zoom. And then the last picture uh, showing you is when this lecture taught by an English um, trainer that is in person that he was able to um, incorporate some on, like hands-on activities and then the farmers was very engaging. Okay. So after the training we test their food safety knowledge. So this table showed you uh, some examples uh, like before and after the results. So as you can see here, the first column gave you the food safety questions that I use. And then the second column gave you the person that th there were three attended, um, farmers attended the training, the hour training, that one day training. So pre-survey, the pre-survey meaning like two, um, uh, two meaning like two um, participants answer that question correctly. And then the post survey, meaning three out of three answered that question correctly. So for example, if you look at on the bottom, um, the bottom, the number three question, which of the following is used as an indicator of focal contam contamination of a water supply? So zero meaning before the training, zero out of three answered that question correctly. But after our training, three out of three answer that question correctly. And then moving forward, if you look at next column, attended the training before, meaning two, another two farmers attended the training before. So they did not attend our training. And so one out of two answered that, qu answered that question correctly. So totally four out of five farm, uh, farmers answered that question number three correctly. So that means not all of them answered number three correctly. So that is the red flag. So in the future, when I develop my training materials, I will use that question as a guide. So I have to make sure I include that, uh, that point in my training materials. So moving on, um, what about the interview results? So when I interviewed my, uh, the Hmong farmers, I asked them what are their current feelings, the feelings about the current FASMA trainings. Uh, I received some good and also something that they want to improve for the current training program. So they all feel um, that the training is very helpful and open a lot of eyes and useful and they can learn a lot and very critical um, to um, the food safety practices. Um, in terms of things to improve, um, I do have one farmer, um, he has some problem with the hearing. So he has some difficulty to hear um, the training. So he suggests us if in the future, then we may consider to accommodate people with a disability. And also because the training is very long, normally it's eight hours, the formal FASMA training is like eight hours for three days in a row. So he suggests um, if the food is provided, we need to ask their preference. So in terms of the barriers attending food safety training, um, besides the barriers that we, uh, we studied in the literature, like the language, and the term terminology presents another barriers. So the farmers indicated that we need to use a little bit simple, simplify the language. 
some of the term is very difficult to for them to understand because of their educational level. And the time is also another concern. So if, um, if the training is provided during summer, like a spring, summer or fall, uh, it's very difficult for them to attend due to it's gonna take, the, take their work day off from the farming season, it's very difficult for them, for them to attend. Uh, transportation, uh, one of the uh, far, uh, farmer uh, is a young, is second generation. And uh, she actually said when she drove her parents, when her parents have to attend a training and she had to drive her parents to the training location. That actually um, added a little bit burden on her. Um, and the lastly is, um, if you look at this, uh, the demographic information from my, the uh, Hmong farmers, three out of five actually are older generation. They are 60 or even older. So um, if you ask them to sit there for one day, and three days in a row and teach them the lecture, it's gonna to be too much for them to understand and take. So when you teach them the information may not stay. So that is their comments on too much to learn at a certain short period of time. And then later I also asked them, okay, when they attend the training, so what are some barriers for them to implement the training on farm? So first they told me some of the information are not practical. Uh, they look very good on paper, but actually some of them do not work in reality. So they said uh, some stuff like they wanna keep the wild animal away for, um, from farm, uh, like uh, scare cross, uh, scare the birds away, but in reality, nothing works. And also lack of manpower. So one of the female farmer, farmers said um, they really need a lot of manpower or manual labor for her to operate her farm. And the lastly is the customer concern. Um, so one farmer indicated when he sell the fresh produce um, at the uh, farmer's market, the customers specify is specifically told him if his products applied any chemical sanitizers and the customer would not like, like to buy from him because the customer wants to have organic product. So that actually put him um, into thought about whether he need to follow the guideline, the food safety guideline to apply any chemical uh, sanitizers when washing the vegetables. So that actually is another concern. Uh, regarding the pre for the food safety training um, format and the language, uh, as you can see, a lot of um, uh, farmers um, that indicated small group discussion and hands on. So I think the reason is because when I asked them to tell me their pre for the training format, they do not have any idea what do I mean and they do not have, have any terms in their mind. So I have to tell, I have to give them some examples. So I said, uh, what about a small group discussion or hands on? And then they all said, oh yes, yes, I like that. Uh, so then they tell me, okay, I like small group discussion and I, I like hands on, uh, hands on activities. So I think that is how the result ended up with a uh, very high number or high frequency of that uh, group discussion. But I think they do uh, love to be involved with um, the learning process and they want to be involved, they want to be engaged in this whole process rather than just sitting in the classroom and just listen an uh, eight hour long lecture. Uh, in terms of the language, they prefer to learn using their own language, but also interesting, um, they also want to have uh, some English, not just a pure Hmong language, they want to learn uh, simple English in the training materials. So what about the, their culture? Uh, when I asked their, about their cultural values, they indicated the relationships or reciprocity, they want to establish relationships with you first, and then they want to be kind with everybody. And they do indicate it, 
um, they are pretty much labor force um, community and they do everything by hand. Um, family oriented uh, community and they stay close to each other and uh, with their family. Um, they sell very niche products. They want to be unique. Uh, they are very hard workers. They have a lot of uh, disciplines um, to stay competitive. And also um, their parents have a lot of authorities. So the kids listen to the parents a lot and they are very humble. Okay, so moving on to look at um, the interview result with the PSA trainers. Um, I interviewed five trainers, three male and two female. So one in 30s, three in 40s, and one in 60s. And two has a bachelor's degree, and the two have a master's, and the one has a doctor. And then I asked the same questions as I asked for Hmong farmers. Um, they also indicated a good side about the FASMA training. And they said it's very comprehensive, covers all the aspects of produce safety rule, and they're very satisfied with it. But on the other hand, they indicated some similar findings from the Hmong farmers. Um, they also said because of the long hours of training, they do get a little bit fatigued at the end of the workshop. And some terms are very technical and academic language is very hard to translate. So it's not just hard to understand, but it's also hard to translate into a plain language for them, for the trainees to understand. And then I also ask, what do they think about Hmong farmers' barriers to attend the food safety training? So besides the barriers has been mentioned earlier, um, they train, the trainers indicated cultural barriers. Uh, for example, you have to communicate things in the way that culturally makes sense. And also there's no incentives. Um, so you don't just offer the training that is free that you think they're gonna come and attend. And not perceived importantly by this group because this group of people have a farming tradition. They have been farming for like uh, 70 years, like 50, 60 years. So nobody got sick before. Now you're going on their farm and telling them that you're doing is wrong and then you have to change your practices. So first changing habits takes time. And then, for, and then also you have to change their perceptions. And it's very hard to recruit. Um, as I said, because uh, relationships, then you have to establish relationships and then getting their trust first. And then that's the time you can, when they trust you, you get into their group. And then that's the time that you can, it's, easy, it's, it's easier to recruit those people. And the last is the technology. Um, because of the pandemic, um, some of the trainings has been moved to online using Zoom, but um, a lot of farmers, they do not have computers where they do not have internet at home, or even they don't have email addresses for Zoom training. So that actually creates uh, some problem for, for um, participation. Okay. So what about implementation? Um, so financial barriers is one thing. Like when they try to implement these practices, um, sometimes you have to pay for it. They do cost the money for the equipment and for um, maybe the sanitizer, sanitizer, uh, sanitizers. So they do cost some financial resources. And also interpretations about the training. So the educators or the trainers, sometimes you have to go and look at what they are doing at the farm and then link it to the trainer, to the menu, to the contents, to be to be able to better interpret it and to make a train, to make the farmers uh, understand it. Um, so that can serve as a starting point. And then perceived importance of the change. Uh, if they don't feel that is very important, and then they won't make it. And the lastly would be the true understanding. So maybe they know the practice that they do is wrong but they don't know what is the good practice may look like in reality. 
So as in their culture, they always say they are, do, uh, they are learning by doing it. So you have to really demonstrate what they should do and just not just by saying or telling them, you have to really um, demonstrate, showing them how to do it. That would be a better way um, to teach them. So about the preferred FUSI training format and the language. So the trainers uh, suggested hands-on and lecture followed by individual consultation and discussion. So similar as the Hmong farmers preference, a lot of involvement, a lot of engaging um, engagement with um, the trainings with the individual uh, farmers. And for the language, uh, same as the farmers, they want to have the Hmong and also simple language. So about the culture, um, besides the culture identified by Hmong farmers themselves, and the trainers indicated uh, they, they have a farming culture. And also, uh, they also have been practicing uh, food safety back uh, in their culture in a different way. So if you want to change their practices, and it's going to take time because they have been practicing this for a long time. For example, they may be used to eating raw products or raw produce all the time and the nobody got sick. And now you're saying it's not correct by eating this raw food. Um, then they probably feel like, why not, right? So it's take time to educate them and then telling them why this is not the correct. And it's receptive. Um, so most of the times they are listening and then they're taking their messages. Um, learn best with hands-on. So as I already mentioned before, they're private. Um, so one of the challenges is getting invited out on farms. So getting the relationship building up and then that is the way that to reach out to uh, to um, to reach out and also to um, promote uh, to recruit the participants to this specific population. Okay, so some results that we um, we um, summarize from the observation uh, of the Hmong farmers for safety practices. So the first picture showing here is a water uh, pond that um, on the farm, um, from one of the farms. So the farmer said they do not use this water to water any plants or veggies. Uh, however, you know, all of the farms using well water. So however, um, it create a risk, okay, of the cross contamination to the clean water supply. So, that actually is one of the observations that we observe. The second, I'm not sure whether you can see this clearly, uh, in the middle of these two green holes, there's a can uh, see the two black dots. Uh, that actually are the two Gini Um, They actually walk around on farms um, that are not supposed to do that. So they can walk around uh, on the plants and um, produce um, that create some food safety risk, risks. And the third picture here is a um, washing uh, station. So using the well water. So the, when they harvest the produce and they wash it on, they wash it on this wash station and then they put it there until I think this is getting ready to sell in the afternoon to the farmer's market. Um, so however, as you can see, there's no record keeping at all. Um, and they, they do not is it they do not have any record keeping habits at all. So it's gonna create some problem in the future. And the lastly is the trash on farm. So all farms burn trash on site. So even um there's no um research indicated burn trash gonna create any food safety issues. However, we believe Believe it's gonna have this gonna increase a risk of cross contamination. So here are the things that to improve on farm. First is the water testing. Um, I know in the few in the near future 
if they want to sell the fresh produce, if they want to sell uh, any products uh, at the farmer's market, and they have to present a water testing result. And uh, I think uh, our um, members uh, are working on teaching them how to take water samples on farm and then get the water tested at the local health department. And animal control, uh, chemical use, because they do not use any chemical to watch the fresh produce, uh, record keeping, as well as the trash management. So our second objective uh, is to develop this supplemental materials developed based on our results from the objective one. So we are planning to have a, an hour, 60 minutes, less than an hour, 60 minutes training PowerPoints with five pictorial posters uh, with very nice words, more pictures, uh, and one fact sheet and one guide sheet in Mo and also in English. So here are one of the examples, the slides that I want to include in my training is um, this slide um, is to teach them what is the, the resources um, is the least likely to contain microorganisms associated with uh, faces that can lead to water uh, food safety risks. So from safer to risky water resources. So in here, I try to incl include more pictures and tell them which one is safer to use. And then this is what I use when I do the training. And then here is a picture I wanted them to take away when the training is over so they can put on the wall. So I kind of use the, um, the simple English language and then also translate it into Hmong. So here is another example of the, about the poster teaching them um, they have to wash their hands and then translate it in the Hmong. So it's very difficult um, to translate it in Hmong because in Hmong, if you teach them the bacteria, viruses, and the parasites, actually there's only one word to describe the three, uh, three English words. So if you tell them the bacteria, you have to have a long description to explain what is the bacteria. So you can see the poster, that three paragraph has the same words in front of each of the English words. So our next uh, activity, our next object, the last objective will be done um, in summer, this coming summer is to provide training and to evaluate the training effectiveness by, um, by the surveys and also by the observations. And also, we're gonna, this whole program will be evaluated by the FASMA trainers. Okay, so I think that's the last slide uh, of my presentation. Uh, I know I have a uh, lot of information I wanna go through, but because of time limits, uh, I think that's all what I have. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm, I'm open to any questions, suggestions. Um, I think, thank you. Thank you, Pei, for presenting. We do appreciate it. And if you have a question, we still have plenty of time for questions. So you can add that either in the chat or the Q&A, whatever makes you feel most comfortable. And Pei, to kickstart the discussion, um, you highlighted that most Hmong farmers in Missouri didn't have a written food safety plan in 2019. So how um, is this population different from Missouri farmers overall? Or are there that many differences in terms of whether they adopted a, a food safety plan? Thank you for the question. Uh, actually, these uh, the numbers, the uh, this, the number ninety seven percent that the number I received is from a local food safety conference. So we do not have an official number about how many farmers did have a food safety plan or not. Uh, um, but I do anticipate the number is higher. Uh, the overall farmer uh, has a food safety plan's number is much higher than the Hmong farmers because of the uh, FASMA uh, law reinforcement. Uh, if you are a new uh, income for selling uh, fresh produce, it's more, it's, it's, it's more than 25,000 to 250,000 that you are required to take that uh, FASMA training. And then I do anticipate that the number is higher than among farmers. Great, thank you. 
Can you briefly cover a few more details or background about FISMA? So what timeline did it set for all farmers to either have the training or have a written food safety plan? And what changed the most for farmers because of that legislation in terms of what they need to do on the farm to, um, to maintain food safety? Yeah, so this FASMA training uh, was originally assigned into law in 2011. So the goal actually is to prevent is um, the contamination of this US food supply um, instead of to responding to contamination of the um, issue. So food safety or produce safety is just one of the key focus areas of FASMA. And they also cover some other areas. Um, so the final um, produce safety rule released um, that was in November, 2015. Um, so there are several areas, the key uh, requirements for the fresh, uh, for the produce safety rule. So I think that includes um, uh, agricultural water. Uh, so in your farm, there's, there's shouldn't, uh, you, you cannot, uh, no detectable uh, generic E. coli. And also the water has to be tested. So you have to test and treat the water and also biological soil uh, amendments, uh, preventing the contamination of sprouts is another one. Uh, animal control, like control wild animals, dom domestic and also wild animals. And the lastly is the, um, uh, on the worker training and also the health and uh, personal hygiene. So the whole, those are the key elements include in the FASMA training. Uh, so to be covered, uh, by the FESMA law um, is if you're a new, as I said, I think it's average, uh, a new monetary value of the produce that the farmer sold in the past three years uh, is more than 25,000, but, no, uh, but, but no more than $250,000. So it's a very small to small businesses. Great, thank you. I appreciate that background. Um, Another question relates to some of the findings from your research uh, and the constructive criticism, the point being that there was technical subject matter that was hard to understand and hard to translate. So what strategies can you use to make that type of information more accessible to the Hmong farmers and other farmers too? Great question. Um, I think that's gonna, that leads to the, the findings that uh, from our previous um, study, pro previous um, results is um, classroom training um, is not that e effective and efficient. Um, so learning so learning by doing is their most preferred um, training format. So instead of telling them what they should do, and I think the most effective way would be demonstrating them what is the best way to do it. So um, also based on the interview, we're talking with those um, PSA trainers. I think most of them um, uh, indicated that uh, the farmers, there's a need for the farmers to have this one-on-one -on -one consolation. So because each farm is different. So there are some, um, the strategies works on one farm may not work on the other farm because of the settings, because of how this farm operates and the size of the farm. So this one-on-one -on -one consolation and also periodically uh, meeting with these um, trainers are very important for each farm, for each farmers. And they also need to ask certain questions when something came up. Um, so this, I think this is ongoing relationships. Um, it's not a short term, it should be a long term. Um, so I think it's not like um, I have these projects. It's a two-year project. And then I'm done, and I'm leave, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave, and then there's no one gonna take care of this group of people. I think this should be a long in the in the long run. Like after two years, I think this should be another like maybe ten years ongoing to help this group. So once you stop, then I, I don't think they have anyone else to get assist with their farming practices. So I think the more practical, more um, consolation would much help for, for this group. Yeah, that's a good point about the consultation. 
Um, I think we have time for one last question, um, and it's sort of similar to uh, the response you just provided, but I'm curious whether you have some additional insights. Uh, based on what you learned in this project about developing a culturally sensitive FISMA training program, what plans do you have to apply this approach to reach other groups, not just the Hmong population, but other farmers with food safety training? Great question. Thank you. Um, I think in this project is just a starting point because Hmong farmers or Hmong population is very special. Uh, Hmong language is not the written language. Um, that's why when you said, okay, you can take these training materials back home, uh, it's, it's not working because they cannot read the whole menu on their own. They rely a lot on their second generation. But that's when there's their secretary has time to read on for them, but they cannot really study on their own. So when they need some information to, to, to refer on, they don't know how to use it. And then there's, because of there's no written language and the, there's no manual for them and they do need a manual. So that is why the, my project is working on is to create some sort of um, um, materials for them to look at it even though there's no words that they can read. Um, so I think that's a, that's a starting point. Um, so um, to say how we can apply this, their cultural value, their culturally um, uh, preferred learning format um, to design a, um, what can I say, um, to design a menu to help them to learn. Um, so I think the, the whole concept can be also applied into other ethnic groups, not just for Hmong. Uh, the whole approach can also be, I think, can also be um, utilized or generalized to other uh, minority underserved group in the future. Um, so also, I think I believe if anyone is, is, is interested in the future to collaborate with other minority group, I'm more than welcome to, <laughs> to talk or to uh, collaborate in the future. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thanks for taking our questions and for presenting. It's time to go ahead and close today's webinar. Thank you to our audience for joining us too. This wraps up the CRC webinar series for this semester, but if you haven't already, then mark your calendars for the Kafner Research Symposium, which will be a two-day event that will take place on October 12th and the 13th in 2022. You can look for more information about the symposium in the next few months. Again, thanks for joining us and enjoy the rest of your Thursday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Pei.